today is the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend and such an appropriate time because uh, Jesus is worried about our remembrance of him. And so today in John's Gospel, he gives us aids, helps to remembrance. We'll look at those helps and see how they'll work in our lives today. I want you to understand that in John's Gospel, especially in this part between chapter 13 and chapter 15, where Jesus is making his goodbye, and he's trying to fix in the hearts of those disciples and of us today what it will be like and how we will survive in his absence, that it's very repetitive, and he will pick up themes that he has already mentioned. He will introduce themes that he will repeat later. And unless you're reading all that farewell discourse, that goodbye statement all at once, you're not going to get it all together. But we focus on the parts today that help us to remember these guides to remembrance. John 14, 23 and following. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make a home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable, or in the name of Christ become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. A text without a context is a a pretext. What's the context? We start with the words, Jesus replied. Not even Jesus initiates a statement as a reply without somebody asking a question. Well, the question comes from Judas, not Judas Iscariot. Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, if Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we, plural, we will come to them and make our home with them. You and I, as believers in Christ, have something the world does not have. We have the indwelling presence of God. Now, when the early church, from the time of Gregory of Nazanus, uh, spoke of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he used a strange word for it. He used the word dance, talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But not, not like a dance today, a boy and a girl out on the dance floor by themselves. The word in the Greek, perichoresis, circle dance. Think of my big fat Greek wedding. La da 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 with a group of people in a circle with arms linked and they're dancing around in that circle. Perichoresis, circle dance. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are tossed out at us today. And he says first that God the Father will send you the Holy Spirit. And then the text says we, plural, will come. And, and then it talks about the Father's greater than I. And, the Holy Spirit uh, it keeps getting introduced. Time He's introduced five times in this gospel. Five separate times we're promised you will receive the Holy Spirit. What is going on? You can't diagram this sentence. 
It's just all, it's a circle dance. It just keeps moving and they're all linked together. And the one thing you know is they're just glad to be here. And it speaks of, if you love me, you will obey my commandment. When I was in graduate school, I had to face the final time of testing to see if I would have to do additional requirements in order to graduate, in order to be ordained. It was called professional assessment. I submitted a 30-page paper. I preached a sermon. I answered any question the committee tossed out at me. And then I went out in the hallway where they talked about me. I came back in and my faculty advisor says, you have no additional requirements, but I have one very strong recommendation. What was that, I asked. The response, buy a puppy. I thought I was in the twilight zone. What do you mean I'm supposed to buy a puppy in order to graduate? Your biggest problem, Earl, is that you think you have to buy love. And so you keep giving of yourself, hoping to find love. A puppy will teach you that when you feed it, it'll love you. When you don't feed it, it'll love you. Unlike cats. Just, <laughs> just saying. Cats demand feeding even if they've got feed in the food bowl. But anyway, the point was, Jesus says today, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and we will come to you and dwell with you. And he's speaking in the plural there and so it's the Holy Spirit, but it's also Father, Son. It's the fullness of the Godhead will come and dwell within you. Just obey. It sounds like it's something you earn. It's not. It's a gift. But the proof of the gift is the sign that you obey. I love the movie The Blind Side. Now, part of it's because it shows white folks in Memphis being good. <laughs> I mean, I'm just telling you the truth. You know, I really, you know, and, and they're, they're what we were taught to call comfortable. You don't call those people rich. You call them comfortable white folks good and 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 they intercede in the life of this poor black kid and i love the idea of race being set aside because a mother is a mother under any condition amen, amen. but the real reason i love that movie is because it teaches me family there is an accusation when playing at Ole Miss that Michael has been bought like a slave in order to be trained to play football for the alma mater. And there's an investigation and they bring him into the room and they give all these accusations. And they finally, finally, finally ask Michael, why did you come to Ole Miss? And his response, this is where my family goes to school. My family, he doesn't look like them. Not the same race, not the same socioeconomic status. But he has been loved to the point that he says, this is my family. And Jesus says today, we'll know what family you belong to based on who you obey. A couple of weeks back, Jerry back there in the corner, y'all look at him and stare at him. He's funny looking. <laughs> Jerry back there said, oh, is Debbie out of town? You remember doing this. I walked in and from the, all the way across the sanctuary, he said, oh, is Debbie out of town? How did he know that? I was wearing a white shirt. <laughs> True story. But you need to understand there's background to this. When I was a young man, my gram would buy my clothes and and she would take me to the men's store at Oakfield. Y'all remember Oakfield Men's Outlet? And and they were that was the only place around that had clothes my size, normal size clothes. 
And, and so we would go and, and the sales lady would try to get me to buy a pink shirt or a blue shirt or something else to go with my suit. And Graham would say, nothing looks better than white. But you know, my definition of family has changed. And so really it's what family do you belong to? You know, and so you can see what color I'm wearing today. It ain't white. You know. But I still have those ties to the old family. And Debbie didn't know any of this. Whose family are you part of? How do you live? Do you do you go to the school your family goes to? Do you do you do the Jesus today says those who obey me are those who love me. You don't earn God's love. But you prove, you show whose family you belong to by what you do, by how you obey, by your very actions. And as you love in response to God's love to you, guess what? He sets up housekeeping inside you. You become God infested. This is not the power of positive thinking. This is a true reality. Some years ago, I went to my, my chiropractor. I, uh, when you've got a back like mine, your best friend becomes your chiropractor. And I, I kept wearing, wearing them out, and I'd had three in like five years' time. I never changed chiropractors. They just quit or died, you know, because I'd put them to work. Walked into the chiropractor's office one day and looked around the room, and there was a few people ahead of me, and so I, I came in to stay, and, and uh, just then the treatment door opened, and out walked a woman that I recognized. She was dressed like a gypsy. I had never met her, had never seen her face to face, but her next door neighbor, who lived about a quarter mile down the road, pointed her out to me. She on her front porch, us out in the pasture, and said she's a fortune teller. And she always dressed like she was some kind of gypsy out of the movies, just very elaborate. She comes out of the treatment room, sees me, arches her back and hisses like a cat and runs out the back door, which had been locked, nailed shut, the steps to it removed and a sign that said no exit. She burst through it and jumped off and out the door and gone, and never came back. Now this is true, not exaggerating an ounce. And Jeff looks at me and says, what was that all about? Now I was as confused as him, but I said the first thing that came to my mind. I said, which didn't want to be caught with the preacher between her and the door? <laughs> she wasn't scared of me. She was scared of what was in me. There's a difference. There's a difference. There was nothing about me that scared her. But I had been in the Bible that morning and I had prayed and I had looked to God as my refuge and my strength. And which didn't want that? Jesus talks about the time to come when he will depart. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. And we, plural, will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. There's just your test right there. Are you doing it? Doesn't matter what you say. Doesn't matter how high you jump or how you shout hallelujah. What matters is, do you live it out day to day? And you can say what you want. But if you don't obey, you don't love. You're not part of that family. You can claim that family. You can pretend. But you don't belong in that family. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. That is, they're an inheritance. Father gave it to Son. Son gives it to the adopted children, to us. And we become family and become God-infested such that we become 
those who carry the gospel to others. All this, verse 25, all this I have spoken while still with you. Now that's a key point. We're going to hear more about that later. But what he's saying is, I'm going to tell it to you now. And when it happens, you'll see that I spoke the truth, and that's going to allow you to be happy. See, what it is is God's promise, as we see it coming true, will give us the peace, the gladness that he's fixing to describe. We continue. All this I've spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit. Now, the word there in, uh, in the Greek, parakletos, is talking about one who comes alongside of. Think of the courtroom. Think of being on trial. Think of your defense attorney. The defense attorney comes alongside you. Trust me on this one. Keep your mouth shut in court. Let the defense attorney speak. Doesn't matter what they say against you. Just keep your mouth shut and let the defense attorney speak. He's your defense attorney. The Holy Spirit. He will be the one who comes alongside and protects you and guides you. He will do more. He will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have spoken to you. Now, the question is, how does he remind us unless it's minded in the first place? You know the etymology of the word remember? To member again that which has been dismembered. You had to know it in the first place for it to be cut off. But it, if it's cut off, he'll remember it to you. I'm using that as a verb. He'll member again that which has been dismembered. We put it in by studying the Word of God. And in the right time, the Holy Spirit will remember it to us. We'll member it again. Peace I leave with you. Now, the peace is based in his telling us all this ahead of time, his promise of the Holy Spirit, his assurance that we belong to the family, but the result is peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. The world calls peace when there's no war. Jesus calls peace when it's the fullness of God's presence. In the Hebrew scripture, it was known as shalom. We're redecorating in the parsonage. That includes taking down certain things. In the hallway yesterday, uh, I was asked by someone who remains anonymous, <laughs> can these three pictures come down? What pictures are they? The pictures in the hallway. Well, which pictures are those? So she pulls them out. One is a, a, a stitching. Something Somebody had sewn something. It was scripture. I don't remember. That's why it was up on the wall, so it would remind me. Then there was a picture of Mr. Wesley. We rehung that one in the, in the study. But then there was a computer-generated saying on typing paper that I had framed from my favorite 14th, 15th century English mystic, first woman to ever produce a book in the country of England, Julian of Norwich, and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. That's not pie in the sky by and by. That's not the power of positive thinking. That is peace from God through Jesus Christ. And with that peace, and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. It's believing that God is with us no matter what it looks like, no matter what it sounds like, no matter what others tell us. God is with us. And He can say, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, do not be afraid. Notice it doesn't say your heart won't be troubled. It says don't let it be troubled. It doesn't say you won't be afraid. It says do not be afraid. In the presence of fear, in the presence of the absence of peace, 
when your heart is troubled, Jesus is saying, turn to me. Let me be your peace. Focus on me. When I cut my foot as a kid and had to have stitches, Daddy held my hand. And as it hurt, he said, squeeze it as hard as you can. And every bit of pain that I felt, I tried to get rid of by squeezing my daddy's hand. Daddy never once said, stop. I noticed when we were walking out of the hospital, he was rubbing his hand. <laughs> yeah. He was showing me love. Jesus is saying, let me be the one who is with you. The world is going to say absence of peace. The world is going to say fear. Jesus says, you heard me say I'm going away. I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. The proof of what Jesus says is we'll see it ahead of time. He'll, we'll see it in the moment. And instead of it bringing us fear, his absence, all this which troubles us, instead of it bringing fear, Jesus is saying you can let it bring you joy. Oh, this is what God promised. Sometimes people come to Christ and uh, almost always immediately are troubled by doubt and fear. You know, it's like they'll hear this inner dialogue, you're not really saved. You know, you've done too much evil. People come to me and I I will say, well, that's just proof you belong to God. The devil doesn't fight against you until you don't belong to him. On the positive side, as you put your trust in God through Jesus Christ, you will see reason to have peace. You will see reason to not be afraid. You will see reason to have joy. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.